All right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this developer chat. This is Dev211, analyzing JIRA tickets using Amazon Bedrock and large language models. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are supporting a national lab. You are in the cloud operations team. You have a new team member that has just joined you. And they start asking questions about how you can better support your customers and try to identify what your customers are looking for. Now, you've been supporting these researchers at the lab for the last five years, and you've generated over 4,000 JIRA tickets. And as you start to think about this, you say, well, there's so much information in these JIRA tickets. It is a treasure trove of data. If we could just access that without reading through 4,000 JIRA tickets, because that is absolutely the last thing that I want to do. So what if you didn't have to read through all of these JIRA tickets to get your insights. What if it was an automated process? And what if you could create better FAQs for your customers? And what if you could also find emerging trends from your JIRA tickets? So this is the use case that we're going to talk about today. Again, my name is Amelia Huffross. I'm a senior cloud engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I've got over 20 years in information technology, and I've participated in a number of different programs, which I would be happy to chat with you about after the talk. So here's the agenda. So don't freak out. There's audience participation, OK? Uh, so we're going to divide this talk into three different sections. The first part is understanding the JIRA ticket use case, how you're going to have fun with your JIRA data once you can actually access it. The second part is diving into Amazon Bedrock and trying to figure out how to use a knowledge base. And the last part is going to be where my team is going from here. So this is pretty much a pilot. We started playing with around 40 different JIRA tickets. And we've been able to extend it to read the, the 4,000. But it's still a work in process. So poll the audience time. How many people have used Bedrock? Yes, all right. Who uses JIRA for support tickets? I love it. So many of you. This is awesome. So who's really curious about large language models? You've come to the right place. So thank you again very much. So if you're familiar with JIRA, which it looks like most of you are, then you know that you have access to the JQL language, and you can type in search features using JQL query language. And you can also set up different dashboards with different charts that tell you basically who's requested your help the most, who's filing the most tickets. So you only know what you know because your customers have been yelling at you. So how do you identify those trends that you don't know about? And how do you then create helpful FAQs? And how can you work to connect these researchers across the lab that may be working on the same stuff and just not realize it? So the first step here is to really pull your JIRA ticket data out. And so to do that, you need to use the JIRA API number two. And we use number two because we have the on-prem instance of JIRA at PNNL. So this is not the cloud instance of JIRA. And when you figure out what you want, uh, you'll see in the, uh, the last part of the top section here, I specifically wanted to limit my data. So I only wanted the key, the summary, and the description, specifically because I wanted those freeform text fields to be able to feed that to a large language model. So when you get this query back, it looks really pretty. The JSON looks great. This all looks like something that I can send to a large language model. However, it doesn't actually work that well. So who wants to guess which service we actually started with? Because of course, Amazon Bedrock was not available to us. Does anybody want to think what other entity recognition product Amazon has? Yes, it was Amazon Comprehend. And Comprehend really discovers insights from your text data, but it does a lot of entity recognition. So if you're doing entity recognition and you have the gobbledygook on the left, it's the entities are being identified as all of these color tags and these new line tags. So what Amazon Comprehend taught me was that my data was not at all clean. It came out of JIRA with all of the email MIME type information because you can communicate using JIRA through email as well as through the software product. So how do I turn something on the left into what you see here on the right? 
I needed the help of a data scientist, so we put together a script with about 15 different regular expressions to make this amazingly clean data that you see on the right-hand side. So once we did that, we could start playing around with Comprehend and get some better results. However, Bedrock had just been released. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can leverage Bedrock, because it gives you access to these large language models that these companies have all spent a lot of time and a lot of money to train. And having spent time training a model for the Deep Racer um, competitions, I knew that I did not want to train my own model. So if you're not familiar with Bedrock, it does give you access to large language models from Facebook, Anthropic, as well as from Amazon. And it's supposed to be a very simple way to access these large language models. It's also this really neat experimentation space. So if you've ever played around with it, they have this really neat chat feature where you can drop in a bunch of data, ask it a prompt, and it will spit back the information based on what you put in it. And this looked very promising when I had about 10 or 20 tickets. So if you want to also create a pipeline, then you need to advance beyond just the console and start using the uh, SDK for Python, which is Boto3. So it is a developer chat. Here is your developer slide. This is basically the, uh, the code that will allow you to communicate with your AWS account. You do your authentication. And then you know it works when you've actually connected to Bedrock. You'll see here that the prompt string to Bedrock is explain black holes to eighth graders. You can see that I started working on this when we only had Claude v2. So provided that you send the, um, the specific information, then you'll get back the response body that explains black holes to eighth graders. And that's how you know that you were successful at setting up your communication pathway to your AWS account. So as I started playing with Bedrock, it became obvious that I was going to have to create a knowledge base. And I mean, a knowledge base is going to help implement this RAG pipeline, right? Which is this retrieval augmented generation. It's basically creating a manner for your prompts to the large language model to be responded to much more quickly, because it's put all of this data in memory in specific locations. But what is it really, right? I, I don't actually know what's under the hood. So if you're trying to get started with this, and if you're trying to play with it, then what it's really creating is an open search serverless vector store database. So that's a whole new thing if you're just starting out, as I was. And so what starts to happen here is you need to understand your data. Remember I said I don't want to read through all 4,000 JIRA tickets? You, you sort of end up having to do that anyway, because you have to determine a chunking strategy for your data. So if you're thinking about very large PDF files or Word documents, you need to set a delineation for how much text is going to be put together into that vector store database. So I'm highlighting this because this is one of the areas that we got to play around with and understand what's really going on. So to create a knowledge base, you really have three steps. You have to create it, you have to sync it, and you have to test it. And so during the creation phase, your chunking strategy becomes very important. And if you're using JIRA tickets, and you've done all of this pre-processing of them, like we had done because we needed to clean the data, they're very small files, and you can write them out individually as JSON files. So you don't actually have to chunk your data. Now, this is very different. So it really depends on what your use case is. If you have very small files where you've already done the pre-processing, you would pick a no chunking strategy. But if you have these much larger documents, like Word or PDF, then you would pick one of the defaults, or you would define it yourself. So that was very interesting to learn. And then a great lesson learned here is that when you are requesting your large language models, you're very excited that you want to pick the one that you want to chat with. However, you also have to pick a completely different large language model in order to set up your vector store database. And inevitably, if you're getting started like I was, you will forget to pick the one that you need to sync with your data store. And you will get a bunch of errors. So hopefully this is helpful to you. 
And when you do get everything working and you select all of the right large language models, you can start asking the large language model how many of my tickets included a specific keyword. And you start to get back some really interesting results. It'll actually give you back the key. And uh, if you recall from the earlier slide, the specific text from the details in the summary section of the JIRA ticket. And over on the right-hand side, you can get more specific information. So at this point, we're just getting started. We've got about 50 tickets that we're playing with. We're trying to figure out how, if this is actually sending us back the right information for our tickets. So the future questions that we're working on here start to really dive into the opportunities with prompt engineering and with using different large language models, because we were only able to work with Anthropic through the console. So what are the most recurring themes in the tickets that we want to know about? And what proportion of tickets showed a problem? And what are the top three problems, for example? That would really help us dive into what our researchers are asking about, how they're navigating public cloud, and how best we can help them. And then also you can ask things like, what are the top five most popular topics? And this particular use case was not interested in operational efficiency to begin with. It was very much a backwards looking, what can we learn from our data? But you could start asking questions about timing and how long did it take for a specific ticket to close? So when we're thinking about this, what's really next for the team? So we really wanted to insert all 4,000 tickets and actually test and see what we were getting back. And this is where we started to experience a number of different hallucinations that were very interesting. And so if you want to know more about those, I'll be happy to chat after the talk as well. And we really wanted to test different large language models to see if we got the same results. So to do that, we need to create a pipeline and do a little bit more of a um, DevOps approach to coding. So that will be coming up here in January. And again, the whole reason we were doing this was to create better FAQs and be able to spot trends. Because as you're familiar, the customers that yell the loudest are the ones that you know about and that you will probably create FAQ documents for. So if you take anything away from this today, I would hope that you learn from all of the fun that I had putting this together and all of the stumbles along the way. So one of the first areas of opportunity is that while you may not want to know your data at all, which I did not, you will end up getting to know it very well. And you will know all of the keywords and all of the terms in order to generate your prompts. And you really want to make sure that you request all of the large language models that you need up front. Because if you don't, you will get very interesting error messages that you get to troubleshoot after the fact. And also remember that your chunking strategy really does matter. Again, if you're dealing with very large PDFs or Word documents, those require a very different approach than if you're just dealing with data that you have already basically chunked for yourself. And I definitely did not do this in a vacuum. I had significant support from the team at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So uh, kudos to them for helping get us this far. And if you're interested, these are the blog posts that we've been doing to support this effort. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture. I know that the QR code was working as of this morning. And if you get a chance, please, please, please do fill out the survey and give us some feedback so that we can bring more information like this to you in future reInvents as well as the summits. So thank you all very much. And I'll take questions after.